All right, everybody. Are we on? Yeah, we're on. Thank you for being here. If you could uh, please take your seats, we'll uh, get started with the presentation portion of uh, the meeting. And uh, Mark, if you can hear me, are you good to go? Hey, Tim, can you check on Mark? He's in the uh, comm room there in the council chamber. Just make sure he's good to go. While we're waiting, uh, we can do a preview uh, for council if they would like after the meeting to look at some new cushions that are now installed in council chamber. Should be much more comfortable for the attendance. Good. Okay, I got you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming tonight to the uh, Stormwater Open House um, for the agenda tonight. So we're going to do a, an overview of staff that are here. We're going to talk about our projects and planning that we got going on. Uh, we have Mile High Flood District here. We're going to talk about partnerships. The city's going to cover that. Mile High will be at a breakout table. Um, and then we're going to talk about capital project implementation, followed by our residential flood mitigation program. And then we're going to open up for Q&A. After that Q&A, we're going to bring up uh, another staff member who's going to talk about our MS4 permit, the uh, Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. Um, and then we have a survey for everybody as well. There'll be a QR code up on the screen uh, for your feedback tonight. We have uh, paper copies in the back as well. Uh, we would appreciate it if you take time to fill that out. Uh, after that, we will move into the open house portion of the meeting where you can go around and engage with specific staff about specific projects and any uh, detailed questions you may have. All right, so staff we have present tonight. Uh, myself, I'm Victor Rochelle. I'm the Director of Public Works. We also have uh, Tim Hoos, our Deputy Director of Public Works. Uh, Tyler Gellis, our Stormwater Program Manager. Uh, in the back, I actually don't see Sebastian. Um, oh, he's right there. I'm like looking for you in the back. <laughs> Sorry, Sebastian. Uh, we have Sebastian uh, Donner. He's our Stormwater Compliance uh, Program Manager. Now, this time in the back, uh, we have uh, Mike Roman. Uh, he's our Engineering Manager. Uh, we also have Devin Keener, who's our Capital Project Engineer. And then with Mile High Flood District, we have uh, Jennifer Winters over there on the side. Uh, we also have uh, with us today in the audience a couple of council members. I wanted to acknowledge Council Member Wright. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, council Member Perrain, thank you for being here. Uh, council Member Anderson, or Mayor Pro Tem Anderson, excuse me, for being here. And we also have City Manager Sean Lewis. Um, and I believe, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, you would like to say a few words real quick before we get rocking and rolling. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rochelle. And um, and all the staff that are here tonight. It's been a long time coming, what the progress that we've made and are currently making here. I know many of you will remember in 2018, we had a, a, a significant flood in the South Inglewood Basin in Inglewood, and, and tragically someone lost their life in that Rachel Haber. And that really woke, I think, woke city council up, woke the citizens up to the need to take a closer look at our stormwater system. Um, I know after that, we started looking into everything and immediately found that many of our, our big storm lines were filled up with gunk that they hadn't been cleaned out in years. Um, we, we discovered that many of the pipes were undersized and there just wasn't enough capacity to move the water out of that basin. After that, we did a stormwater master plan that was in 2020. We passed that master plan um, and realized we had issues all over the city and we had to come up with a long-term plan on how we're gonna get all this done, how we're gonna fund it. And this has been, I think, if I'm gonna name one thing that's been the top priority for city council over the last five years, this would be it. That we've put more time into this than any, any other single issue. And I know staff have put way more time in <laughs> than city council has. And we're at a place now where we're close to finally getting that South Inglewood base into a place where the water will actually be able to move out there and get down to the river and then we'll be able to go on and move move on to other projects. It's been huge. I think these are some of the biggest projects since you know since Inglewood was built out many years ago. Possibly um, the largest projects in 50 plus years in Inglewood, especially with the detention bond that's going in right now. Um, so thank you, staff, for putting this on and keeping the citizens informed. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. 
All right, so let's uh, jump right in to our planning and uh, projects. So uh, first, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Anderson touched on it, is our stormwater master plan uh, by Hazen in 2020. So uh, pr the study reviewed previous studies and developed a 15-year capital plan uh, for the city to enhance our stormwater infrastructure. It included programs and projects, um, things that we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are your programs. Uh, there's uh, Devin at the back uh, covering some of those tonight. And then our projects, those ca big capital projects that we really needed to invest in to improve our stormwater infrastructure. Uh, on the screen here, it's pretty, it looks like you can see it there. On the left-hand side, you've got the programs. Um, so I'm not going to read them all to you, but um, in the program name there, you can see we got GIS. We got uh, surveying and cleaning our stormwater pipes. Uh, we're going to touch on that a little bit later. Those are projects that are actively ongoing in the city. Some done, some half done, uh, some will be done this year. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, you've got the summary of CIP projects. A lot of these are either done or in process, and those are some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. Um, things like uh, Hamden Avenue, uh, you got um, Dry Gulch on the list. And then you'll see on there, you got the Corrugated Steel Rehabilitation. Uh, we did some of that as part of the South Inglewood Flood Reduction Project. We lined that pipe. Uh, that was a very large diameter pipe, and we've been having trouble with it throughout the years, which I think most people are familiar with seeing in the news. Uh, from there, uh, our maintenance and repairs projects, these are things that we're working on and where we are today. So as I touched on that map survey and mapping, uh, we are working on the south half of the city right now. We completed the north half last year. The contract was let this year, and they are actively out surveying the south half of the city right now and inventorying it. Uh, complete system, uh, large diameter pipe cleaning and in the cleaning and televising that, that has been completed. The small pipe and inlet cleaning, that is part of that inventory and mapping. Our contractors are working hand in hand. So they're cleaning them and then they're inventorying them. So we actually know what's underneath the dirt or rocks, whatever debris is in the pipe, get that cleaned out and then survey it so that we actually know the true condition of our pipes and our storm network. Install rain gauges. We got one in Rotolo Park. We are actively working on one in Duncan Park. Uh, we're coordinating with Mile High Flood District so that we will have more rain gauges in the city so we can have real-time data, know what's going on, and how our system is performing. Cleaning and televising maintenance. Again, we're doing a little bit of that with our contractor. And then actually, uh, Tyler's team does a little bit of that. Uh, we do a lot of cleaning in-house, uh, whether we notice it um, in the neighborhoods, in the community ourselves. It gets reported via uh, Ingle Fix or Q Alerts. Our team, our stormwater team, can respond and go clean those inlets. And I would just like to say thank you for to City Council for supporting uh, the 2024 budget purchase of a new VAC truck, uh, which is the key piece of uh, infrastructure or equipment that our team needs to clean those inlets. Uh, so that will go a long way. Emergency projects and maintenance, those come up um, as needed throughout the community, hopefully less and less as we continue to make these improvements. And then the corrugated metal replacement. Again, this goes back to the survey. If we find corrugated metal that's got problems, we're trying to rate those and then look at budget and get in there and repair it before it becomes a problem. Uh, here's uh, just a quick uh, map showing uh, our inlets that are in GIS. Our stormwater division has two operators that are out there doing that maintenance, you know, cleaning, televising, uh, addressing those Q alerts, the Ingle Fix requests, those kinds of things that come in. They use that truck, the VAC truck I mentioned, the flush with a push camera, clean inlets, um, and they cleaned oh, almost 400 inlets in 2023. Are we on record to beat that this year, Tyson? Or Tyler, sorry? We should be? Okay, good. Yeah, we have a full staff this year. Last year, we had a full staff for, I would say, about half the year. Uh, unfortunately, we lost one of our staff members, and so we, we've restaffed back up, and they are at full steam ahead now out in the community. This is a, a map of our 2023. Again, last year we did the north half of the city. Uh, this is showing kind of where our inlets are and we're integrating the data that we're getting from our contractor. We're still receiving a lot of that data, refining it and making sure it's in our system and it's usable data for staff to make sure we're on top of our storm infrastructure. 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim Hoos to talk about some of the Mile High Flood District projects and partnerships. We have quite a list there. All right, thanks, Victor. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, flood district partnerships. It's actually pretty uh, lucrative for the city. We've uh, talking to Jennifer now. We've uh, put together about five million dollars worth of funding with the district that we can use directly in Englewood. So I'll go over the different projects we've got uh, funding allocated for. But total, it's about five million, and only half of that is from the city. So the flood district has given us about two and a half million dollars for projects within the city here, which is a great benefit to us. It makes our money go a lot further. So. The first project we have is the uh, major drainage way plan update. And what that is, is that's the all the uh, creeks and streams through the city that come through here that are kind of regional. We uh, The flood district uh, helps us study those and prioritize all the improvements needed on those bigger creeks and streams like that. So we're able to understand what needs to be done first and, and have the funding to be able to do some improvements on those. We're hoping to have that done here later this year. It's been a little while we've been looking at that and studying it. And it's been a little while since Englewood's plan has been updated, so we're uh, seeing some changes and things we're trying to sort through and figure out and have a, a good plan for the future, so that, that's coming together here. And then the uh, Little Dry Creek Basin Hydrology Update, that's the uh, kind of the basin there off of uh, 285 and Broadway there, kind of just north there, the, the plaza area and stuff, that's Little Dry Creek there, so that, that study is coming together, the new hydrology and the numbers are coming through, so we understand how much water is coming through there and what we need to do to prepare for that and be uh, have the infrastructure needed to uh, handle that uh, flow that's uh, coming through there. And then the South Englewood Basin Improvements, that is a uh, another pool of money we have if, if we do uh, have any further improvements needed in the South Englewood Basin. We're hoping there's nothing left there. We've done quite a bit there, but we are still having the uh, the major drainage we plan and studying that to make sure everything is, is functioning the way we expect it to. And assuming that's the case, we can use that funding anywhere in the city. It doesn't have to go to the South Englewood Basin, so we'll be able to uh, take advantage of that funding in other priority areas if, if we uh, find that the South Englewood Basin is uh, where we think it'll be. Then the Dry Gulch Basin improvements, that's a uh, the basin uh, kind of in the northeast area of the city that goes into the city and county of Denver. It's uh, kind of east of Broadway, north of Dartmouth there that, that winds through that neighborhood there. It's uh, similar to the South Englewood Basin. It's pretty much a piped network through there and it's uh, some pipe is undersized in that area that we need to study and understand where those bottlenecks are and be able to get that water through there without flooding homes. Particularly in the 100-year flood event, there's some, some issues there that have been uh, identified. There's a, a master plan study that's already been done that we just need to execute some of those things. And then the install the rain gauges, that's something that's done through the flood district. They manage that whole network of rain gauges throughout the whole metro area. So the, the gauges we have are tied into their network, and you can look at them on their website and see the real-time rain data that, you know, as, as it's falling, it'll total it up. And you can see at the end of each storm how much rain has fallen in, in uh, each of those gauges and understand how big of an event we have. So it helps us to understand, you know, how much rain has fallen in a certain amount of time so we can understand, you know, is it a 25-year, 50-year, whatever type, type of storm it is, and understand, you know, how our system's reacting to the, the different levels of rainfall. So those are the the five different projects we have going on with the flood district right now. And I'll talk about our capital program here a little bit more now too. These are our, kind of the implementation of all the capital projects from the master plan. So we do have the uh, the design and construction of the project S3A and S3B. Those are in the uh, the upper South Englewood Basin, kind of in the Tufts and Acoma area and uh, Broadway and Union kind of down to Tufts and Acoma, kind of, and then further east upstream there is all that area. And we, we did two different projects on that uh, in 21 and 22. And both of those were totaled about, I think, uh, three and a half to four million dollars. And those both got done. And they are both functioning as intended there. We, we've got a lot better flow through that area now. And we're able to route the water appropriately so it doesn't go through private property anymore. We're pretty happy with the results of that that we've uh, achieved with those projects. And then the design and construction of projects S1 and S2, that is the, uh, we changed the name of that to the South Englewood Flood Reduction Project. And that is our project we have to install the regional detention ponds that are going on right now in the area of uh, Navajo and Radcliffe. If you ever drive down Windermere, Navajo, there you'll see it. There's some closures and things. That's the pond going in down there and all the piping that's going in and out of those new regional ponds that's going to, that's what's going to help our Oxford pipeline that's in Oxford kind of uh, going west of uh, Navajo there, that the one that's given us so many problems where these ponds will help us to control the flow of water in that pipe so it doesn't uh, overwhelm the pipe anymore. So we're really happy to see those going in. And uh, those are uh, those ponds are sized for the 25-year storm event. That was the biggest uh, capacity we could get with the funding we had available. It's still still not cheap, but we are, we're excited to get at least the 25-year protection down there and be able to take care of a lot more of the storms that come through the city. 
So, and then uh, the next one here we've got is the, uh, the hospital project, we call it there. That's on Old Hamden between Broadway and Clarkson. We've got a, a pipe over there that's, that's pretty too, too small and it's been repaired over the years and it's just not, uh, not to the capacity and we, it needs a full replacement. So that's, uh, that project actually, we just uh, sent that project out for bids. We finally got the design done and we're ready to uh, get bids on that. And we're hoping, bids are coming in mid-August and we're hoping for a good bid price and we can get that construction going and get that pipe upsized to where it needs to be so we don't have issues there in the hospital district over there. So that's, uh, that's coming together. We're excited to see that one uh, finally get, uh, get started here. Then the dry gulch improvements, that's part of the flood district uh, plan there. That's what they'll, uh, so the flood district projects, the way those are done, the flood district actually manages the project for us. The city provides our 50% share, but the flood district has a staff that manages, designs and manages it for us. The city, we always obviously have a, a say in it. We have a, a seat at the table, you know, to, to dictate what's gonna happen. But the flood district, it's, it's really a great program they have to, they design and manage it and uh, manage the construction as well, which is really a, a nice thing that really can, uh, in, uh, increases our staff capacity basically you know there's a whole other team there doing stuff for us so it's nice and then uh, and then the uh, the next one here the design and construction of the S3C and S4 those are also both upper south Englewood uh, basins there that are priorities on the master plan and those are planned for next year we've got to uh, kind of uh, evaluate our budget and see where we're at with those to, we're hoping to continue on with that uh, Ocoma stuff and, and be able to do that and keep going but those are uh, as, as we get the ponds and stuff built, our funding is, is starting to max out. You know, we, we kind of plan for a, a 30, $30 million worth of work and we've kind of maxed that out. Now we've got all that done. So we're trying to, to see how much more we can stretch those dollars before we'll need to, uh, to find some additional funding for the larger projects. And then this last project here, it, it says minor, but to me, that's kind of one of the most exciting projects we have right now. We're gonna be able to get into the, uh, these minor improvement projects. What we refer to those as is they're kind of localized flooding areas. If there's a, an intersection or a certain smaller area of town that's got a, an inlet that's too small or a pipe that's too small, we can go in for you know, a few thousand dollars and make a really big difference. Those are really, to me, those are the fun engineering projects to do. You can do a lot with engineering to get those done and not spend a lot of money to, to make a big improvement. I know we've got, uh, adjacent to Rotola Park there on Huron there, those inlet grates are too small and it floods all the time and it's, it's because the grates are too small, right? It's a very simple project, but, but it, you gotta get it designed and you gotta get it out to bid and get somebody to build it. But the stuff like that, you know, we can make a big difference that every time it rains, it won't be a pond over there anymore. And that's, it's a few thousand dollars, we make such a big difference. So it's, I always think those are exciting to, to be able to do something that impactful for a, a minor amount of dollars. So that's, that's exciting. We're finally able to, to get started on some of those. And uh, Mike uh, Roman, our engineering manager, is in charge of that. He's going to be doing that program for us and be able to really move some of those projects ahead that we've identified. And here, this, this slide here just kind of shows the funding we have allocated for future years just to kind of understand how the, uh, the funding has been spent and where we're going in the future years and kind of based on the, the funding we have coming in each year, what we'll be able to do. So as you see in 24, we've got you know over $21 million worth of work we're doing to get all this stuff done. And the biggest one's obviously the, the South Englewood uh, stormwater improvements there, 17 million, those ponds are not cheap to build and those piping and that, that's where a lot of our budget is going. And then the hospital project there's for 3 million, we've got that going as well. So once that money's spent, that, that does, uh, all that funding there was based on, we, we got the, the loan, the stormwater loan we did based on our rates, we were able to get a loan for that large amount of funding up front. And we also did a, a bond. We uh, were able to get a bond for uh, $10 million. So that's, it was 20 million loan and 10 million for the bond that we were able to get 30 million in funding there. And then those obviously come with a payback. We've got to pay that funding back. So for the next few years, we're going to be a little bit burdened with those, uh, those payments each year. But uh, we, we do still think we can move ahead with a lot of different things. And we, so basically if you look at this proposed project over the years, as you get to 25, six and seven, you'll see the repair and rehabilitate the existing storm sewer. The, that's the, uh, you know, as, as we do the mapping and we determine the condition of the pipes, we wanna make sure we have money to repair the pipes that are bad. We don't wanna find pipes that are bad and not do anything about them, you know? So we wanna allocate funding to that every year and make sure our, our bad pipes are getting replaced so we don't have sinkholes and those types of things in the city anymore. And then we've also got the, the very last project on the bottom there, the small area drainage improvements. That's the ones I just talked about. That's the funding we have allocated to do in those localized in the grates or uh, upsize a uh, piece of pipe or something just to make a big difference. So we're putting money towards that as well to make sure we can address those needs as they come up. And then the other two funding sources we have for future years, that's the uh, money we're gonna, we're sharing with the flood district. We wanted to make sure we can take advantage of as much. That's the funding that the flood district has available for Englewood if we can match it. So we definitely wanted to make sure we can match as much of that as we could to basically double our money. So we've got those, 
the South Englewood plan and then the, uh, the Dry Gulch, Harvard Gulch plan, or those are two that we're still putting money away to build those in the future. Those will most likely be our larger projects, the ones we do with the flood district. Those will be our next big, big spending ones for stormwater that we'll be able to, like I said, we have a little over 5 million uh, set up with the flood district right now to do some big things. So we're, we're excited about being able to still move forward with a lot of those other bigger initiatives. And then this last thing I'll talk about is just a program we, we started recently here this year. It's our uh, residential flood mitigation grant program. So we did start a, uh, a program where we kind of identified, you know, there's certain problems can't be solved in the right of way. And Alicia is here. She's our first uh, participant in the program. She's our beneficial there. She's gotten some good things out of it. But what this is, is we, we have money set aside. It's $50,000 we set aside to to provide to property owners to, to help them fix their, their issues on their own property. Some some houses, just the way they're situated and the way their lot is, there's a lot you can do by just flood proofing the house and doing some things with the window wells and the, the curbing around the house. And Alicia's done a great job with hers to, to really protect her house. And it was very cost effective. You know, it's like $10,000. She did a lot of good for her property. And it's it's a lot cheaper than going in the right of way and trying to do stuff out there. Sometimes you just, if you do stuff with the individual properties, you can make a big difference and keep the water out of the houses. So we, we have this program now that any resident that's within the floodplain that's experienced any kind of uh, flood damage in their house can apply for this funding. And it just, <clears throat> here's kind of the rules of the game for what we have. But it's, yeah, as I said, it provides funding to, it's for residential properties only. And it's basically mitigates flooding on private property that we, we've allocated some money for that. And we've Got up to 10,000 per property available is how we set it up. We didn't want to, you know, have all the funding go to one property. We wanted to spread it out best we could. And then the property has to be in a floodplain. And then uh, it must have incurred infiltration from a street or alley within the last two years. You want to make sure it is something that, you know, we're going to be solving a problem there. And it's something that's, that's fairly recent that's happened. And the application is available through the city's website. And you can apply up through December 15th. It goes through the end of the year, basically. We've got this funding allocated for 2024. So it's... Definitely a good program if there is uh, anybody here that's got any kind of issue like that. I'll be over at the, the minor drainage improvements table. You can let me know and we can get you set up for that and get you going on that. If there's somebody has any issues like that that can uh, benefit from that, we certainly want to uh, do what we can to help out. So with that, I think we're about done. We can uh, answer any questions or any kind of discussion. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, good. No, 10,000. She, she did the 10, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's up to 10. We, yeah, so we got 50 total. Yeah, so there's 50 for the program, but it was 10,000 per property. And Alicia, she was, she had enough things there to do that we were able to get her the 10,000 to do her. Right. Yeah. That's it for the year anyway. Yeah, that's how much okay. we have for this year. Yeah. Oh, okay. You want me to say it again? <laughs> All right. Okay. So a lot, yeah, yeah. It, well, and she, yeah, she did a good job with it. She did a good, yeah. No, she. So how do you, you want to tell Alicia? I can, I can say it too if you want. <laughs> There's a whole list of stuff she did. <laughs> Hi, um, I unfortunately uh, live at the home where Rachel Haber had passed away. Um, I didn't know it when I bought it, but here I am with a home that's flood prone. Um, so what I did was I had 18-inch window risers installed in all of the um, uh, window walls of every basement window. Um, I also got... Mm -hmm. it's, it's basically an 18-inch riser that they seal to the existing egress window um, so that there's no water that comes in. And then it also has a cover, too, so that if it's a really heavy downfall, it doesn't flood the window wells. Um, I had the, um, in an area of the yard where there seems to be a low spot, I had concrete wall built up. Um, it was about two feet in height. Um, there was already an existing wall that um, went down to the basement. I added another six inches there, and then I also built up three steps. So all of that concrete work, uh, the window risers, I put a sump pump in the basement um, stairwell. Uh, I also got some electrical work done to make sure that that some pump is on its own dedicated outlet so if something happens in the rest of the house because of water that that'll still work. Um, and yeah, that's about $10,000. <laughs> um, there's one other thing that I'm doing is um, 
there is, I, I've been working with a, a flood proofing company out of uh, Texas and Illinois, and they have some things where you could put almost like a, it looks a gate that you could put at the bottom of your door, and it's pressurized, and so um, it it goes up to like 36 inches. But essentially, if the pump fails for any reason, which I'm hoping it doesn't, um, then at least you can mobilize this quickly and pressurize it to where it will no water will get into the um, the door the front door it's the best thing to do other than getting a flood proof door completely around which is substantially more money you're welcome is there any ability to put a uh, auto dialer to a 911 service a flood sensor in the basement in case those uh, as a tertiary in case those uh, things don't work I mean they're designed to work but sometimes there's just mother nature and it can take all that over the top as we unfortunately had to uh, witness uh, about six years ago it's a simple device an electrical engineer or an alarm tech company could do that for you is there That's any funding left for that? I definitely would something it. I could look into. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, yeah, at least it's used up to 10000 but it's certainly an option we can look at and see what that would take, because it, it is a good idea. That's a good backup plan. Yeah, it goes sure. to an auto dialer. Yeah. It could do uh, with an alarm system company of your right. choosing. Yeah. It's a very simple IC circuit, yeah. on or off. Mm -hmm. The sensor can't possibly yeah. be too expensive. I've done it for right. a multi-million dollar Building, so it can definitely be done yeah. residentially. It's definitely yeah, cost effective. Look into, yeah. Anybody else have any questions or anything? All right, well, if not, I'll, I'll turn things over to Tyler here. He's going to talk about how we keep the stuff out of the storm sewer in the first place. Oh, sure. As far as how they, sure, yeah. So the question was about how the rain gauges work, how they, uh, the gauges we're putting in, how they record the data there. Are you referring more to the, the functionality of the gauge or just why we put them where we put them? Or? So yeah, that, that could be a little beyond my knowledge or that's it's, uh, some kind of a cup I know that measures and that the pressure in the, uh, based on the pressure in the cup, I think sends a signal to electronic reader that then uh, tells it how much is in there or whatever. It's some kind of measuring, uh, I don't know, Tyler, have you seen those gauges? I, I don't, probably should have had a picture of what they look like, but it it's, uh, basically measures, I don't know, Jen, do you know any more about the gauges that the... Yeah, yeah. No, it's not a cup and ruler. It's a little more sophisticated. But Jen might have a little more. She's... I actually don't know more. Bruce would know more. He's his whole system with the rain gauge network. Yeah, we, we but can get you the information. Yeah, the, the flood district buys them and installs them, so we don't have a lot of knowledge of the actual functionality. But they, they are kind of the the standard in the metro area for all the cities around Denver. They use that same gauge because it is a kind of the state of the art or whatever. That's the best type of gauge to use for having the most accurate measurements we can get. But yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have more of the. It's kind of an interesting question now. I got to go look that up and see. I guess I'm kind of curious now. Yeah, I can, how it does I can get function. you some more technical information about the gauges and how they work, and send that to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, great. So yeah, if, if that's all, uh, Tyler's going to talk about how we keep all the contaminants out of the storm sewer and all the dirt and stuff, and what he's doing to to keep it from uh, filling up like it was before. And we're trying to keep all that out and make sure we don't have to to clean our system out quite as much. We keep it out of there in the first place. So I'll let Tyler uh, talk about the different uh, parts of our MS4 program. All right. Um, Tyler Gellis, the uh, stormwater program manager here at the uh, city of Inglewood. And I uh, just kind of wanted to take one, one additional part of our stormwater program to kind of follow up on uh, Victor and Tim's nice presentation about kind of our big projects going on and uh, some of the capital improvement stuff, but there is a whole nother component to the stormwater program that maybe may or may not be as familiar um, as kind of, um, it's, it's not as flashy as a nice project, but it is equally as important, um, which is our MS4 program. 
Um, you might ask, what is an MS-4 and how is it regulated? Um, an MS-4 stands for a Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. So this is a federal program. Um, it is a, at the most level um, started by the EPA um, because there was there needed to be a, something in place where um, to minimize the pollutants entering in the environment. So stormwater, unlike wastewater, um, you know, wastewater, you flush your toilet, it goes in your sanitary drains, it goes to the wastewater treatment plant, filtered out, cleaned, discharged back into the river. Um, stormwater is not. Um, there is really no treatment of stormwater. Uh, wherever the rain, on, rain hits, whether it be your house, your driveway, a commercial building, an apartment complex, all that runs off into the street and enters our storm drains. Um, those are the catch basins you see with the little grates or um, open on the, the curb back. There's a very different, uh, a lot of different kinds of ones you can have, but it's really taking that water directly from the source, entering the system and then discharging into the river. Um, so, you know, obviously a lot of pollutants run off in that way. So how do, how do you mitigate that? So the, the federal government started a program that any um, locality um, of various sizes, and, and they do have different um, requirements depending on population size and, and um, kind of land masses. You know, if you do have these systems that are entering, receiving runoff from streets, houses, bills, businesses, they need to regulate us. So, um, and this can be cities, counties, universities, military bases, and even CDOT are all kind of separate MS4s. Um, it's based on population size. We're a phase two MS4, which is kind of the lower level of an MS4. Um, and then there are phase one MS4s like the city and county of Denver. Um, where obviously have more population, have more risk of um, pollutants, so they have a little more stringent requirements than we do. Um, and part of that um, MS4 program is that we do have to have a stormwater management program, um, which we're here talking to you today about. Um, and I, I keep mentioning it's a federal program, which it is, but um, the federal government kind of delegates it to the states. So every state, which you can imagine, has different hydrology, different rain, different land uses. Um, so if the federal government were to have one overarching permit, it probably wouldn't be very applicable. So they do delegate it to the state. Um, so Colorado has their own MS4 program um, that the CDPHE um, puts in their own um, kind of requirements um, that are applicable to this area, and that's what we are following. Um, there are five minimum control measures that have been identified that if we implement these control measures um, in the city, that we will reduce our pollutants to the greatest extent practicable. Um, that's my favorite word because what does that really <laughs> mean? Um, you know, the best we can do to reduce pollutants, um, we, you know, you recognize you're never going to minimize everything. I mean, you're going to get some in there just based on the nature of stormwater. Um, but we, we, can do what, we can do what we can and we can do our best to try to minimize that, um, which is, and I'll touch on each five of these um, specifically in the upcoming slides, but we do public education and outreach, similar to today's event. Um, we do look at illicit discharges. Um, we um, manage construction sites. Um, we do look at post-construction stormwater management, and then um, even at the city with our municipal operations, we have certain things we need to follow. Um, so we're not exempt either. Uh, we regulate ourselves as well. Um, and so how, do, how does the state kind of know if we're doing our job? Um, we do submit an annual report every year um, to CDPHE, um, Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, um, and it's due March 10th of every year. So they kind of review that. Sometimes you don't know immediately if you're doing great, but um, um, they do kind of review reports and kind of give you, you know, feedback or come down on you if you're doing anything bad. But luckily, we, we have not had any feedback, so I think we're doing a good job. Uh, the first minimum control measure we, um, we have to regulate, um, well, it's not really regulate, that we implement is a public education and outreach um, campaign. You know, education is an integral part of a successful stormwater program. Um, I've learned um, that it's often not because people want to do anything bad, it's because they don't know. They don't know the proper, you know, procedures to reduce pollutants um, and, you know, knowledge is power. Um, so a big part of our program is public education and outreach. Um, we can do both passive and out active outreach activities. Um, I apologize, I don't know if you can really read that table. Um, but it kind of also shows that um, it's a good use of it because we have those are all the activities that we can implement to meet these permit requirements. Anything from attending um, public events, you've probably maybe seen us at Celebrate Inglewood or Neighborhood Nights or even the Hop and Shop. Um, we do, um, you know, brochures, mailers, um, social media posts, website posts. Um, those are kind of all active, um, kind of getting the public engaged, um, kind of having those conversations. And then we'd also have passive outreach. Um, I don't know if you've driven around, you kind of see our catch basins. Some of them have a, a little sticker on them with a fish that says, 
don't, no dumping drains to the rivers. Um, or, you, you know, you might be able to see, um, we don't really do it in Inglewood, but, you know, I think Denver and Lakewood sometimes do bus shelter advertisements. So something that's kind of passive, it's there, you see it in your past, and maybe you think, oh, what is this? Maybe I should learn more about stormwater. Um, per the permit, we have to do two, uh, four activities a year, two passive, two active. Um, we far exceed that. I think last year we did maybe 15 different events and different things um, for this kind of outreach campaign. Um, and we can't just do anything. Um, we do have to address water quality impacts. And those two big impacts are nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as um, pollution discharges, so oil, antifreeze, you know, kind of those things, um, grease from restaurants, things like that. Um, the next minimum control measure we do um, is a illicit discharge detection and elimination. Um, so what is an illicit discharge? An illicit discharge is a discharge that contains anything that is not solely stormwater. Um, so you kind of think, well, how is that possible? <laughs> um, so, you know, so stormwater runoff, um, but, you know, if it contains soaps, paint, anything like that would be an illicit discharge. Um, so it's kind of an overarching, like I said, if, it, if it's not just stormwater, there's a lot of things that run off. But per the permit and per our city code, um, we do allow certain operations um, that have been deemed to kind of have a minimum impact on pollution. Um, a couple of examples like landscape irrigation. Your landscape irrigation is not stormwater runoff, but it's pretty harmless. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an allowable activity. Um, water line and hydrant flushing is an essential part to kind of maintain our infrastructure. Um, that's an allowable discharge. Um, and individual residential car washing. Like, you, you can wash your car at your house. However, I specify that that because if you're a commercial um, or a business, you cannot wash your car outside. It needs to be in a contained um, kind of undercover, drains to the sanitary where that water is treated. Uh, the idea is that, you know, commercial um, business will obviously be washing more cars than we hope you would at your house. So it's kind of that level of where's that risk um, versus maybe being too, um, regulating too and too intensely. Um, so we do, um, per this program, it's both response and resolution, um, you know, it's kind of goes with the education campaigns, um, but we do um, get a list of discharge reported to us and we do respond to them typically very quickly, especially if it's uh, during working hours, we'll be out there, you know, within a few minutes of notification. Um, and, you know, through Ingle Fix, you can report these listed discharges if you see them. Um, we, we just get a lot of phone call complaints sometimes, um, internal reports. Um, we have a great staff here um, that, you know, see something, say something, and they, they live by that. And then we, we just see things in our day-to-day -day travels. We're out a lot um, doing inspections. The operations staff are under me. So if we see something, we, we will go investigate it. Um, and as I've kind of a key opponent here, you've kind of said education is a key um, to prevention. If, if you don't know any better, you're going to keep it up, um, but fines are possible. Um, if education doesn't work, we can fine up to $999 per day per violation that it is occurring. Um, our incidents are tracked. We track every incident that we respond to, even if it is not an illicit discharge, we, we still document it, that we responded, what was the cause. Um, and that kind of allows us to either see repeat offenders or um, kind of establish some priority areas where Oh, we're seeing a lot of discharges here. Maybe we, maybe we should drive around there a little more. Maybe we should monitor a little higher. The next minimum control measure we do is our construction site inspections. Um, Inglewood, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of redevelopment and new development. Um, and actually, construction sites are a huge source of pollution, as you can imagine. And it's not just, um, you know, your typical pollutions, which we call pollution prevention like practices. So, your concrete washouts, uh, your material storage, uh, making sure you know you don't have any hazardous material just laying around, your fueling, making sure that's right. Um, but also erosion sediment control. Um, if, if you don't have the proper controls in place and it rains heavy, all that sediment is washing off your site, all that sediment is going in the road and then eventually entering our storm drains. Either it could be clogged or just discharging into the flat, um, which, which does have a detrimental effect on um, aquatic life. Um, erosion sediment control, you can do both structural and non-structural control practices. Um, some structural stuff is silt fence. Um, you probably see that black fence around construction sites, straw waddles, um, inlet protection. So in case you do have a, a discharge, you know, that sediment is not entering those inlets. Um, construction entrance, big vehicles, make sure dirt falls off those tires before they drive on public streets. Um, but, you know, non-structural ones such as, honestly, stabilization is the best thing you can possibly do. Um, either at your house or even any construction site. You know, if, if the ground is stabilized with grass or you know, pavement or whatever, you know, the rain hits it and, and the sediment cannot run off. Um, and that's kind of bringing it back to more of that kind of, you know, natural environment. You don't just have sediment leaving the construction site. Um, 
So each one of these sites is, um, we do uh, review plans. Every site construction site has to, if it's an applicable construction site, um, which is anything 5,000 square feet or more um, in the city we issue permits on, they have to have a site-specific erosion sediment control plan. Um, you do see some common um, practices a lot, um, but it's, this is not something you can just print off the internet. You do have to build it and design it per your site. Um, smaller sites are simple, big sites are very complex. Um, so, you know, each project we review it, we provide comments um, and make sure that it meets the regulations and it's, it's something we are comfortable with before we issue those permits. Um, so, like I said, we do issue permits um, in the city, um, anything over 5,000 square feet, we issue a grading, erosion, sediment control permit. If your site is over an acre of disturbance, um, you have to have a state construction general permit. So you're not only regulated by the city, you are regulated by the state as well. Um, and these are the responsibility of the owner and the contractor. Um, the city is not responsible for this. We, we regulate them, but it, the contractor, the owner of the site is responsible for making sure they're maintained, replacing them, you, you know, expending that cost. Um, and the permits do stay active until final stabilization. So we issue permits at groundbreaking and they stay active until the site is stabilized per the plan, either paved if it's like a parking lot, a big commercial business or a grass. Um, and, we, and we do that and we, we leave them open for months sometimes as you watch grass grow, sometimes they don't do it right and it takes a long time. So um, we do stay those open, we, we do uh, monitor those for the life of the project. And um, city staff does do inspections. Sebastian Donner is our um, stormwater compliance program manager and he, um, he kind of does most of the inspections. So if you think good job, it's because it's Sebastian, he, he stays up on them and makes sure they're doing the right thing. Um, and, and we do establish frequencies. So some projects we do once a week, some we do twice a week. Just really depends on the risk factor, how close they are to the river, how big they are, like where are they at in the phasing of their operations. So it is kind of a fluid um, kind of inspection um, procedures. The next one, minimum control measure of MS4 permit is our post-construction stormwater management program. Um, so post-construction stormwater management are um, kind of Control measures um, for both new development and redevelopment that control that stormwater runoff after the site has been built. So we monitor while it's being built, and then after it's built, we make sure that control measure that's installed um, to kind of either reduce the, so when you, you either develop or redevelop, you're changing the land use. So either it could be all grass, um, and now it's a condo complex, or maybe it was a small house, and now you have a lot of duplexes. Either way, you increase the impervious surface from the natural environment. So we require um, installation of a post-construction stormwater management devices that kind of hold back that water to kind of more mimic the natural runoff um, characteristics of the site. Um, so uh, kind of the redevelopment, it's not just new construction, it's also old construction to kind of get some of those grandfathered old projects back up to modern standards. Um, these are either, you know, kind of the um, water quality ponds you see full of water, um, you know, but now they have a lot of proprietary sometimes. You might think, oh, there's no stormwater management on that site, but these are actually underground systems, under parking lots, water enters through a drain, gets filtered out, slows down, and then is released, and you may never see it. Um, so, but then you can also have something as simple as, you know, some vegetated buffer. Um, so water runs off some grass, it's slowing down, that grass is absorbing those pollutants. So it doesn't always have to be this big structural, expensive thing. Some little some minor um, improvements go a long way. And then once again, we review these plans. We make sure that they, they meet the requirements both from our um, local kind of regulations and codes, but as, as well as the state permit. Um, and then, you know, you're only as good as the maintenance that is performed on your system. So we do uh, make sure that these people are maintaining these post-construction stormwater management measures. Um, and depending on the measure, it depends on how often it has to be maintained. So sometimes it's every six months, maybe every year, maybe every five years. It really just depends on the site, depends on what's installed. Um, and stormwater is never, it's never usually one, uh, one thing fits, one size fits all. It's always, uh, it just depends on where they're installed and what the site is. Um, and the last um, control measure that we do as part of the permit is, like I said, um, is pollution prevention for municipal operations. So we do regulate ourselves. We do make sure we are following the right measures um, to reduce pollutants entering the environment. Um, as you can imagine, most of this stuff is in deals within our service center, um, where most of our operations are based out of. Um, so we have four different uh, manuals that kind of help guide staff to make sure they're doing the right thing. We have our Municipal Operations Stormwater Manual. This is just full of SOPs for anything from hydrant flushing, um, putting a vent on in a park, uh, snow removal, just what measures do you have to follow to make sure you're, you're doing the right thing. Um, 
We also have a municipal runoff control plan. This is a control plan of the service center um, to make sure that obviously we have a lot of a lot of moving parts over there. We have um, so to make sure that we are not discharging into our drains and proper procedures and control measures need to be in place. Um, we also have a, a spill prevention control and countermeasure plan. Um, this is strictly mostly for our fuel. We um, have a fuel island, fuel tanks at our service center where we fuel our equipment. Um, so we make sure they're in good shape, um, functioning, um, have their you know um, double containment. If there was a leak, that is kind of contained and not entering the environment. And then we do have one for our magnesium chloride tank specifically for our snow removal operations. Um, we train our staff on this. Um, we have a training we do for all the new operations staff that come into the city. Um, we do that about quarterly uh, to make sure you know new staff aren't getting overlooked. And then every couple of years we'll do the operations staff as a whole, and we'll do public works, utilities, parks. Um, so you know really anybody who's involved in those municipal operations. Um, and we also do annual inspection of our facility to make sure we're not missing something. Um, you know certain things are in place and we're in good shape. So, um, you know, that was kind of just a high overview of our MS4 program. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, so we'll take any questions and discussions you may have. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Uh, what's the acre feet cal calculus for runoff in Inglewood? How many acre feet? I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> for the drain basins as it relates to the three or four drain basins. I, I do not know. You said the acre feet of water runoff that could be possible as it goes into these, you know, our drainage districts. You know, we, so each drain, we have the city divided into a few drainage basins. Um, I, I honestly, I do not have that information handy. Um, could go back to you if you need it though. Okay. Uh, as it relates to the parks, is downsizing the parks really a good idea in your opinion for uh, catch basin and surface runoff as it relates to the prior question? Downsizing our parks? Yeah. I, I wasn't aware we were downsizing our parks. Or grass areas. There's been talk about it. It's not, it's not a, uh, it's, it's presented as an idea. It's not. Yeah, I know there's some improvement for playgrounds and things, but, uh, you know, they'll have to meet the same regulations that all the other developments need, so. Okay. And if you go back a few slides, is there a way to report uh, the property that, yeah, one more, maybe two more. Yeah, that one. Bottom left. That did nope. I go too far? Too far. Okay. Yep. Nope. Too far again. Yep. The go one forward. with the uh, tri uh, the, the sidewalk quad. train. The, yep. Okay. okay. So you see the bottom left picture exactly opposite of where you took that picture at the top of that block is a similar situation to what you see there, and it's got the grate and so on. Okay. Their water is full, like right now as we speak, this much. We haven't had rain in weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Their drain is uphill from the slope of, if you look at that picture, how did that get approved on Corona Street, right across from the, uh, the um, Meridian? Right there on the corner. Yeah. I mean, it's we, not this one. That, that one's at the other end of the block. That one's done correct. It has, it's, it's done right. I, it's just I know it, because I walk by it all the time. Yeah. Why would they, how, how did they get a certificate of occupancy four years ago? How, how long has your entity been? I, I've been here since November 2022, so that okay. predates me and that predates my staff as well. Um, so I, I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so it's it's it, so obviously there's been new codes and stuff. So you're not responsible for that. It, it, yeah, and if I could, prior inspectors uh, overlooked that. If I could jump in, um, so if if it sounds like it has a continuous water flow, they could have a broken sprinkler and groundwater that's coming out that. No, the uh, the curb. Is this high? Oh, the, and the, the curb is about bumping. where you are, except I'm lower here than where the drain pipe's at. Okay. It was built inverse. Oh, obviously. okay. So the water's actually going the other way. Yeah. Okay. But there's no money, so it's not. So what I would say <laughs> is if, if um, we have the Inglefix app, um, so you can download it and install it on your phone um, and submit a request through there. Um, you can also go to the city's website. Uh, we have uh, a way to submit uh, what's called a Q alert or Ingle fix on the city's website. And then, as uh, Taylor or Tyler mentioned earlier, you can also uh, call in straight to the stormwater uh, group as well and request a review or uh, put in a, a concern, and we will check it out and then respond back to you. Yeah, it's not a city property; it's a private property. Uh, well, in we, this we instance, would, 
if it's if the sidewalk and the chase drain, which is what you see in the picture there, is in public right away, uh, we'd be happy to take a look at it. Okay. Yeah, and the water of yeah the water of course is not right there at the curb and gutter. Sure. It's it's on the uh, property and you Across. know it's a mosquito thing more than anything. So okay. that, that's yeah, we can take a look at that and then we can also involve code if appropriate and if there's a code violation. So uh, we work very well with all our other departments, whether it's PD, code, parks and rec. Uh, so public works and stormwater transitions multiple departments gotcha. uh, when we have issues. And so we collaborate very heavily and we'll, we'll certainly do that. Okay, depending cool. on what we Thanks. find. Absolutely. Um, I, Sorry. I've been talking with my neighbors over on the 3300 block of Marion below the new Noble building that was built on top of the Bullock site the old mortuary. And I talked to everybody down that block um, in the last seven days and I got multiple, multiple complaints out of them because the, the drainage system that was built into Noble, what their understanding of it is, and I don't know, is there's some drainage pond under that building and there's one spot on the east side of Marion where all that water spews out. And it's just like somebody turned on a hydrant when there's a, a rain event or some other drainage. And they say the volume of water that flows downhill from that noble site down Marion just engulfs their gutters, runs up on the sidewalks into their yards, brings debris down onto their automobiles. It's just, I, I guess, all of the drainage from that site now, which is massive, it was built sidewalk to sidewalk to sidewalk. Um, and then halfway to heaven, um, it, it all spews out of one hole and it just floods their, floods down their blocks towards the elementary school. Okay. Yeah, we're looking at that. I, I've not seen that during a rain event. Um, a lot of those buildings, especially those big apartments, do have their stormwater facilities underneath. And yeah. in order to get the water up, there, there's a pump um, that brings it into, into the they, discharge They say point, it spews so. out of a hole in the ground yeah. and it just, it just flood, you know, floods along all their properties and floods their sidewalks their vehicles into their yards and it's just a nightmare yeah so um i believe i don't know what table it is the minor drainage deficiencies we do have a clip we do have a clipboard um if you put your contact information or even just the location in the comments um okay. we we have a list like tim said we're kind of going around these and making improvements and if they're undersized you know doing those studies and you know we we can't be everywhere at one no, time so we rely on we rely on this sure. information to kind that's of why i go out and talk on, to my so. neighbors because our council member doesn't get out into the neighborhood and then i can find out issues and i told them that i would come and speak we, to them yeah we're, i mean they uh, don't have computers a lot of them are in their yeah. 70s or 80s and they don't have the I know there's a lot of people that do have the technology to do it at that age, but these people don't. So yeah, absolutely. Insane. I said like I said, let, let us know about it, and we'll, we'll add it to our list, and we can get it studied and kind of review it, and um, if, it, if it ever decides I, to rain again. I'm waiting for it to rain again, because <laughs> we'll i got to go over and see this fountain of water that spews out of the ground <laughs> onto Marion. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I, my question hopefully is a little bit more simple. Um, are there any regulations about how much um, snow melt you can use on your sidewalks or whatever? Because we have a safety issue versus a, versus a river issue. And we, you know, we always put snow melt um, on all of our sidewalks and, you know, and sometimes it gets into the street too. Um, there, there is no regulation that I'm aware of. Um, uh, you know, as we talk about pollution prevented practices, obviously snow melt's not not the best, but there is a balance there between life safety and uh, environmental pollution. So, um, you know, can't you got to got to be able to walk down the sidewalk. And um, so, I, there's not a regulation I'm aware of, um, and, and that's one of those kind of delicate balance situations. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, I don't know if I should ask this now or if I should take it offline, but going back to when the slide that um, Tim and Victor did, they're talking about the 2025, I think it's the Acoma Street, it was like the S3 or S4 or something that's going to happen. What exactly is that project consist of on Acoma Street? That might be a question that's better for, for Tim. I'm not overly familiar with that specific project. Yes, that, it's this thing work. It's more uh, piping upsizing and inlets. I think there's some on Delaware and Fox. There's some sections of piping that are smaller that need to be upsized. They're they're more localized flooding issues. They don't really affect private property as much. So that's why we've kind of 
put them towards the bottom of the list. They don't really, not as impactful as this, this 3A and B that we did. They're going to be more, I think there's two or three streets that still need some upsizing of pipes just to make sure the intersection doesn't flood in a heavy rain event. So I can get you the map of them, but they're very specific uh, okay. intersections that are looked okay. at there. Okay, thanks. We do have some maps at tables. Uh, yeah, real quick, well, we do have some maps at tables. We also have staff who have uh, laptops uh, with the engage pages up, the Inglewood engage pages, which are websites that are specific to certain projects. Um, so if you have questions, we can go through that. And those those websites are updated regularly. Um, if you if you have a computer and can get to those, I would recommend bookmarking them and keeping an eye on those. We also publish uh, through the city's Facebook page uh, updates on projects as they are going as well. And then, of course, there's always uh, you can call the department anytime uh, for updates as well. Okay. <laughs> any other any other questions? I was wondering uh, if you haven't addressed anything about uh, um, <clears throat> people who blow leaves into the street, people who blow, you know, grass into the street. It's mostly the commercial people that come through. Yeah. So we um, that that is a tough um, that's a tough one, um, but we do do. Um, public outreach campaigns we post on our Facebook, we post on our um, Inglewood homepage to kind of educate people to, to not do that. Um, you know, there's so many people cutting their lawns every day. Uh, that, that's a really tough one. Um, but we do try to educate them on bagging leaves, not blowing them in the streets, um, because ultimately that all drains and then accumulates on the grates that have to be cleaned. Or um, if it all rainstorm happens and accumulate that, that's kind of what backs up these, I call some flooding issues. So we do do uh, public outreach campaigns on that, try to educate the community on best practices. So uh, we're aware and we're, we're trying our best to, to try to mitigate that. If it's a commercial uh, entity and you've talked to them, you've talked to that neighbor and they're still not going to do anything, is there another resource that, uh, I mean, is that... Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be our code enforcement division. Um, so you can either provide that information to us and we can forward it along, or you can put that in the Inglefix system and it can get routed to code. Um, but they're, they're going to be the, the right source for like commercial businesses and, and you know, kind of that more high, high level operations. Uh, we, you know, homeowners we can talk to and have that nice conversation, um, but that would be something for code enforcement. Any other just to add to that real quick, one of the challenges our code department has is catching them in the act. Uh, it's very difficult to cite someone if you don't actually see the action happening. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but uh, this past winter we had a situation where we had multiple commercial businesses pushing snow into the road. Um, we were able to catch them in the act and cite them. Um, so the public works very heavily with code in those kinds of instances, whether it's leaves, grass, or snow. But uh, as Tim mentioned, yeah, please report it if you see it. You can come to us. You can go to code um, and get that in there. And yeah, pictures would be fantastic as well. Yes. <laughs> Evidence. If we took pictures, I, I, we would have to defer to code. I would imagine it would be, um, but code would be able to specifically answer that. Yeah. yeah, so we get a lot of reports of not, not just that, but a lot of kind of Q alerts, and it's usually just a description and a... We, you know, pictures, documentation, evidence is really helps helps us along go goes a long way. So, yeah, at a minimum, it allows us to have that conversation with whoever's in the photo and show that and say this needs to stop and here's why. Any other questions? And if it comes up anything, we'll be in the back at the table. Um, What about apartment people working on cars in the streets? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's another tough one, um, especially um, that, that's also a code enforcement issue. Okay. Um, you know, for us, it's more of the pollutants entering the environment uh, or like the catch basin entering the system is really where we get flagged as, you know, that, that part of the MS4 program. Um, th that's a tough one, but once again, that's a code enforcement um, issue that, that could go after this. Um, okay, thanks. Owners. You could go to the next slide yeah, for me. Just, uh, yeah. 
Um, so we have a, a survey and there's hard copies in the back, um, but if you have your cell phone and you're able to, to use, a, and we'll leave this up, um, if you're able to use your phone, that link will take you to a survey to provide some feedback on the information tonight. Uh, and again, if, if you're not comfortable doing that, there are hard copies in the back um, if you wouldn't mind filling them out. Uh, again, we have some refreshments over here in the corner. Please help yourself uh, to go around the room uh, on tables. We have Mile High Flood District, uh, Jennifer over here, uh, immediately to your right. Um, we have the, a table for minor drainage uh, concerns to, to please come report those if you're aware of those in the community. Uh, then we have our MS4 uh, table where Sebastian and uh, Tyler will be sitting. And then we have uh, Devin in the back if you have questions about our stormwater inventory. And then Mike uh, is covering the South Inglewood flood reduction project as well as the old Hamden if you have specific projects or questions about those projects. Uh, last thing I'll mention, if you did not sign in when you came in, I would ask that you please do so. Uh, Sign-ins are in the back. And then we do have a map. If you'd be willing to put a dot on the map where you live, we would appreciate that feedback. Uh, just helps us uh, gather uh, who we got and what uh, basin you're in and uh, helps inform some of the discussion we're having tonight. So thank you everybody for being here. We appreciate your participation. Yes, sir. So I, I would imagine as we continue to develop uh, new updated master plans and projects, we will probably continue to have these meetings to, to engage and make sure this information is getting out about what we are doing in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.